Do you think everyone can become a po professional poker player? No. I think that most people can't become professional poker players. Today, Jason Kuhn on the podcast, and that was a very deep episode. We talked about his journey as a poker player, but also what makes it to be a good poker player, what you should consider uh, in, terms of, in terms of your mindset and what also Jason Kuhn recommends when he grew up, what was he doing wrong and how he improved. And yeah, I found it personally a very deep talk. Um, I think you guys will learn a lot in terms of what it requires to be a good poker player and also some very interesting learnings for your own life. So I was very... Yeah, very grateful to have this call, talk with one of the best in the game, someone who has been around for more than 10 years, 15 years almost. So yeah, I hope you enjoy that epi episode. Of course, if you have any kind of questions or suggestions for guests that you would like to see on the show, let me know it in the comments and now enjoy the show. So here we go. Very excited to have Jason Kuhn today here on the podcast. And we have been playing a bunch of against each other. So I really appreciate that you took the time. Thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Yeah, I shouldn't be on here after all the times you beat me up. Actually, that's the <laughs> way I wanted to start. I was like, dude, do you hate me? I feel like no, I'm oh sun God, running no. against you. You must no, have heard that. No, this fancy V guy. He's just taking all my chips, having aces against kings, having better trips against me, sucking you out yeah. big time <laughs> over and over again. No, man, I, I really, we've all played enough hands at this point. You know yeah. how it all works. Yeah. So no hard feelings. Plus, I mainly play short deck, so I'm so used to thinking I'm going to win a hand and not winning the <laughs> hand that it's just, it just feels natural to me. Yeah. <laughs> Has... Is it helping you to play a high variance game to also have a cooler mindset in No Limit Hold'em or other formats? It certainly has. It, it helps me. Uh, it, it was like a fast forward into understanding that you just have to play a lot of hands. And yeah. it was just one of those things like, you know, you lose whatever. You, you're sitting there to, at a table where the money's just flying in left and right and you can lose <laughs> 20, 20 buy-ins in a session, it's very different than no limit hold'em. You know, if you lose six buy-ins in a session, it's it's pretty brutal in, in a yeah. cash game in no limit. Um, so yeah, seeing the bigger picture and kind of zooming out, it, uh, playing the higher variance games, I think that you could say the same for a bunch of the PLO guys. I bet they have that same experience. Yeah. It's something that when people ask me, Ben, okay, so why are you so chilled on stream? Why are you not getting overly excited when you know, you win a big cooler or you get mad when you got a suck out. And I think playing six max hyper turbos and these like very mm. um, 25 big blinds, sometimes 10 big blind satellites, you have like hundred, hundreds of all ins, you yeah, know, exactly. you, you really manifest a, a much more resilient mindset towards, towards bad beats. So I always encourage people on the side, especially when you play tournaments to mix in some certain goals. I think it really helps you to, First of all, strengthen your ICM understanding, but also you shouldn't be playing similar buy-ins, just very, very, very low buy-ins, really just to, to get used to all these all-ins. And I think it will help for tournament as well. Definitely. Yeah. Why did you start playing uh, short deck? Is it because of uh, the action? Is it the games are softer? <laughs> well, I was actually, I was at a, um, a prominent businessman's birthday party and a couple of known whales um, were at this birthday party and they were, they all had their phones out and they were playing short deck on an app. And this was a long time ago, right at short decks inception. And I was like, Hey guys, uh, could I, could I play with you? And they were like, Oh, it's a different game. You don't know how to play this game. So the second I got home, I was like, okay, how can I teach myself to like play this game? If, This is what these guys, because the whole time they had their, they were laughing and they had their faces glued to their phones. And uh, I saw the size of the game and I was like, all right, well, I'm friends with those guys. I just have to learn how to play this game now. So I learned the rules and immediately jumped in and started, started playing and uh, got my butt kicked for a while. That, really? that standard story. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I had to start playing it. Um, 
2K Hong Kong. So the first game I ever played was like $260 US ante. So quite a big game to, yeah. be, to learn the rules, basically. Uh, Maybe just for the ones who are not familiar with short tech, what does it mean if you say 260 ante? You don't have small blind, big blind, right? So, yeah, exactly. So everyone at the table, so it's actually quite a huge game because everyone at the table has to post one ante and then the button posts a second ante and then the action starts to the left of the button. Mm -hmm. So like a 200 ante short deck game is like 300, 600 no limit or even bigger. Um, because the, the average stack size, like a hundred antes in, in short deck is like 40 big lines and no limit. So the money just flies. Mm -hmm. um, is it no limit or pot limit preflop? No limit. No limit. No limit. Yeah. So it was, it was really, uh, quite an intense way to learn the rules of the game. But luckily there were a few fun players in there that if you just realized what a good hand was and what a bad, bad hand was, you could almost break even. Okay. I always had the impression I played a couple of tournaments and a bit of cash game short deck just because it intrigued me and I'm surely not beating those games. And I felt like, wouldn't it be much better to make it pot limit? Because um, since since the equities are so running so close preflop, you're just going to be shoving so much. I feel like that's why Omar is pot limit. So you have yeah. going to have way more post flop. So... Um a couple thoughts and you have to excuse me this conversation i'm probably going to cough here and there i'm getting over covid i'm sure. fine yeah. but i kind of i still have a little cough um but we really for the longest time wanted to make it pot limit pre-flop no limit post-flop so you could still put people in the blender on the river um but you just do what the what the vips want to do yeah you know? and they and so it, it did suck for the game that the average stack kind of just kept getting shallower and shallower and shallower. And by the end, we were just playing really big stakes, push fold, basically. Um, but if you play, I think a better way to look at short deck is rather than play it as a hundred anti buy-in, favor building games that are 200 antis or deeper since the average stack size is so much shallower relative to big blinds. So most online sites do like a 50 anti buy-in or a hundred anti buy-in where is if a hundred antes is 40 big blinds, how many people are going to want to play like a 40 big blind, no limit holding yeah. game, you know? So if you make it 200, 300 antes deep, it starts getting really, really hard and you can't shove preflop. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's spots where sure you can stick an ace King, but, uh, there's not really a bunch of spots where it's favorable to just like rip 300 antes over a raise or something. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think it's just, we're so, used to thinking and everything in terms of big blinds that um, we're like, oh, well, we're all in so much in this game. And it is true that the equities run close together and there's going to be more all ins. But I think we just should play a deeper. If you're talking okay. about the intricacies of the yeah. game, we should just play deeper. OK, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I find No Limit also personally way more interesting because it just gives more room for creativity, different bet sizings, over bets. I just had to make this experience yesterday against mm -hmm. our good friend, Mike Adamo, who la loves to put everyone into uh -huh. the cage with his over bets on the he river. Sure yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why pot limit, not a big fan of, feel like would be better, but I think that's the ideal solution. Uh, indeed, Agreed. to just play very deep, right? That's right. And it is insane. Playing like three handed, uh, uh, really, really deep against great players. There's, there's, in my experience in poker, there's nothing like it because there's so many spots where since there aren't that many cards in the deck, card removal is such a big deal. So there's so many spots where people get to make enormous bets on the river. Mm -hmm. um, you know, theoretically, it just makes sense to go all in for 10x pot, like over and over and over again. So there are crazy spots in short deck because the blockers are so important. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. What would you say were your biggest mistakes when you started out, especially with your no limit hold and background? Um, <laughs> no, so in no limit hold them, uh, you never have a good hand. You know, it's pretty hard to have something like if you have top pair, you're pretty thrilled in no limit hold them. Yeah. So every hand in short deck kind of looks appealing to bluff with um, because you always have a gut shot. You always have bottom pair. You always have you know, some, you have some stuff. You block, so you always block something. You, you always have some blockers, right? Yeah. So it, it's really, really um, tempting to just kind of over bluff every single spot, but you can't because you just run into the nuts too often or run mm. into hands that 
Cliff. don't care yeah. if you have the nuts. Yeah. You know, if you have an open ender, it's like I don't care what you bet. We're flipping, kind of. You know, mm. so just not generating as many folds as I thought I would in the beginning, and risking too much money to try to take down pots. And also um, in no limit hold'em, you're so used to playing heads up pots because everything is raised and called. Mm. You know, you rarely ever play a four way hand. Um, whereas in short deck, you're always playing limped pots with four or five people in there. So it gives you a lot of room to make mistakes over over stabbing, betting too big, um, continuing hands that you should just hold, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can see myself in that for sure, especially yeah. in, 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 in No Limit Hold'em where even even playing three way, four way is still so undiscovered. I mean, <clears throat> just running one solve takes an entire day compared to heads up because the game tree is so so much more intricate. So big. Yeah. It so really you either have rent a server or you have a decent hardware at home where you can run those sims. So yeah, I can I can definitely relate to that. What what are you playing uh, recently now you're just mainly playing short deck online i guess there are not many live games happening right now given the circumstances It, exactly so the first half of this year was or i would say the first half of 2020 was insane um it was like everybody in asia was stuck at home bored and they all wanted to play so it was like never sleep play short deck on ipads all day all night um so we ended up playing, there was one guy who just had unbelievable endurance. So, and the games ran around him. So I, you know, for three months, basically, I would just four table on, on, on an iPad, um, playing really big short deck. And it was, it was great, but it was very, very stressful, exhausting times. And then after that, I, I, um, played some online. I played, you know, I had, some, I always loved playing tournaments, even if they're not very big. You know, if I'm bored, I, I love to just get online and, and re reconnect with my roots, which is playing online tournaments. You know, yeah. I love doing that. Um, but for the last few months, I've, I came back, I uh, had a, uh, or I bought a house in Vegas. So the last two months, I haven't been able to play online because I've been in the United States. But I'm going to take a trip in February and then. Um, post up in Vancouver and ski in Whistler and play online for a couple months just for fun. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the games will be big or anything, but I'm just itching to get to work. I see. Where where are tournaments where you originally started or did you start in a different format then you transisted, trans transitioned into tournaments at some point? Yeah, so I actually started playing all three. Um, I just played it. I was so obsessed with No Limit Hold'em, I just tried to find anything that was running and I would play it. So I started playing sit and goes, heads up sit and goes. I played a ton of sit and, heads up sit and goes. Did and, you play against Dan Coleman back then? Yeah, I did. And um, I played against Ike and Scott Seaver and Liv B mm -hmm. and all of those guys. Like, um, you know, I wasn't as good as the top guys. I, I was. I could win at between 200 buy-in to 1K buy-in, just being a field player. But those guys had done a lot of work and um, and I just theoretically wasn't strong enough to hold my own in those days against the best yeah. guys who had played all the reps. But I still had a lot of fun doing it and I won a little bit of money. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then MTTs were where I, I got my first breaks of large amounts of cash. So I was like, whoa, you went a lot playing these things. So I... I That's where I really dove in. And I mean, that's a long time ago, man. I'm talking uh, 2007, 2006, I started playing online in TT. So that's like basically when the internet was invented. <laughs> what, what, was, what was the young Jason Kuhn doing back then? What, where you oh would say, what would you where we would say today, hmm, dude, <laughs> my younger self, this is something you should have done different in terms of poker. Oh. So many things, um, you know, I, I was obsessed with training videos and I, from the get go, like card runners and the earliest kind of formats of training videos, but everything was all tricks back then. And it was just all opinions on what tricks were working. So you just really didn't think about the value of your hand. It was more like, 
oh, I saw Phil Ivey uh, five bet all in with five three offsuit. So, <laughs> you know, when I, if I, I yeah, so if that I was against Lex Feltos, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. he called for like King Jack like off. Re- <laughs> yeah, he had like a reasonable combo. You know, yeah. he was like Lex was kind of in the ballpark of doing something reasonable, and then Ivey was just like, <laughs> I'm all in. You know, so we all wanted to do that. We all wanted to be like Phil Ivey. So I would, you know. I, I would cold four bet all in with seven four suited and just be and wonder why like why I got called by Ace King or whatever you know. Um, so it was just really all spots and y- you would make ridiculous folds and like you know fold your big blind with Jack nine offsuit but then open like Jack three offsuit on the button and think that that was like a better play for some reason. Yeah. Um, you know it was just there were no unless you were like the limit mixed game guys. There was no software really, and it was just it was just learned by what worked, and and everybody folded too much back then. So yeah. that that resulted in you raising too many hands, three betting too many hands, and basically never cold calling because you could just make a three bet of five big blinds, and a guy would fold half of his opens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just this, created a really weird meta. These small three bet sizings, I remember even just four and a half big blinds. I remember there were hands where. You were 50 big blinds deep and you had six bed forwards and that kind of funky stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In these days, people, I mean, you barely have any fold equity if you're two and a half x three bed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really funny. Yeah, I mean, people are, you know, they saw AI outputs and they're like, oh, yeah, I guess I should just call when he, whenever he makes it that size, you know? Yeah. But back then it just wasn't like that. Yeah. Where you, were, where you were someone that, okay, so you then at some point might have realized, okay, I might be too, too aggressive here. Maybe also, I don't know, I'm not assuming, but maybe a bit too big of an ego or a little bit too scared in some of the spots or what everyone poker player is struggling with at some point. Were you someone that you realized it on your own or have you had someone you looked up to and you learned and you adjusted along the way or how did you, how did you evolve as a poker player, especially in your earlier years? So one thing that I, I always did right was I would always try to linger around people who were better than me at poker. Like, even if I didn't, I never thought I was very good. I did have that going for me. Like, like I never thought I was one of the best players and I wasn't yeah. um, early on, but I saw the guys who were winning a lot and I would pull up all their tables and I would watch them and, and I would message them in the chats of the, of the full tilt poker or whatever. I'd say, Hey, you know, You want to talk some poker hands. So my first poker friend was this, uh, was Nick Ramponi. His name online was pure cash 25. He was an incredible MTT and heads up, sit and go player who, who ran a $10 free roll to over a million dollars while he was still in college. And he was my first AOL instant messenger, uh, poker friend. And the whole time climbing the ranks as I would go play a live tournament or play online, I would just always be curious to listen. I didn't, I never thought people were, even if they didn't have results as good as me, I, I never thought I was like superior to them. So I think mm. one thing I did really good was I was just open to taking in opinions and information. Um, and that helped me get a lot better. Yeah. I feel like every successful poker player who, when I talk about what was the, um, I don't want to say epiphany, but what has helped them the most? It's just, you know, getting the input, getting the feedback of of others. Do you think that this is something that poker players realize because the game is so complex and it can only be solved or um, understood better by getting as much feedput, feedback or input as in other areas? Or w- why do you think that is? Well, the, I think the main problem with the way that the group of the poker world thinks is we all have our little echo chambers, our Mm. little groups of people that we bounce ideas off of and whoever the best person is in that group or the best person that we've observed in that group, we're all convinced they're the best player in the entire universe, you know, and that's just human. That's the way humans think. It's like, we all want to, think that we're better at what we do than what we are. And oftentimes if you're ignorant to knowing how good certain people are, how much it takes to be really, really good at something, it's very easy to 
assume that you or someone else is way better than what they are. That I think that the uh, that's called the Dunning Kruger effect. It's it's when you're basically ignorant to how ignorant you actually are. Yeah. Um, and the problem is with all of these groups. You know, you still see it even at the highest levels. You see group think where. You know, the the Americans will say some North American is the best player and the Germans will say some Germans, the best player and some Swede will say a Swede's the best player, you know, because that's that's our little group. Um, But for me, like the biggest shock to that for me, it, it was like terrifying in a way was after Black Friday, I moved to Vancouver and I became friends just randomly at the Rio with Ben Tolerine, uh, Ben 86. Mm-hmm. And I would see him at the gym sometimes. And him and I both lived in Vancouver. And he's like, hey, man, I'm an introvert and I don't really like living with people. But I, but if you want to try to be my roommate for a while and like play poker and work out with me, uh, you know, let's do it. So I was, I was like over the moon. Oh, my God. I get to move in with Ben 86. And – but it was the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen whenever I realized how good he was yeah. and how, how he studied the game. I was like, holy shit, like my career, like I'm a failure. Like, like I'm such a whale and I thought I was pretty good, you know? But like that was the biggest moment for me to realize like, I, I, like most people just aren't very good at poker. Like they're just not. Yeah. And there's so much more that we can do to improve uh, than most people are willing to do. And he was the perfect example of like, if you're willing to give up everything and, and only focus on one thing and do it the right way, you can become great. So for me, that was like, I don't know if that answers your question, but that was like the biggest um, epiphany for me. It related to like, yeah. okay, there, I need to get better. That's that's very good input because I feel like you have two different groups that I think it's also a big issue in these days where, especially with social media, you see all the perfect lives and you see all the success. No, nobody barely talks about shortcomings, failures and bad beats in, in life. So, and I can also relate to that group of people that it feels kind of intimidating. You know, everyone shows the hustle and the hard work on social media and I'm pretty sure there might have been also people that, let's say, they were in a similar, similar situation as you are, and they see Ben 86 working so hard, they're like, oh my God, that is what it requires to become so good, I give up. Or it's just so intimidating, right? So why did you, instead of giving up, why were you able to take so much inspiration out of it and work even harder and become better? And what would maybe your advice <laughs> be to someone who is in that situation and feels overloaded with all that Mm -hmm. fake success, right? Especially in poker, man, like nothing is transparent. Everyone has 20 million in cashes, but nobody talks about Mm -hmm. the 50 million in buy-ins. Yep, yep, of course. I'm pretty sure, and and I I also know from a lot of players, they're not winning anymore for a long time, but they still have 10 million, 20 million cashes. They're top top 100 at all-time money list, but they haven't won a penny in like the last 10 years with poker. Yeah. Yeah, basically any person who is is bouncing around telling everyone how good they are isn't very good. Um, the best players don't have time for that shit. Yeah. You know, they don't have time to show all the money they're winning. They, they don't care for people to know. Um, you know, there is value, I guess, in selling. I, I, I'll say selling out, but that might not be the right word. Mm. But there is value in some of these guys kind of crusading around saying how good they are because – if they convince a bunch of people who don't know that they are that good, maybe opportunities come, yeah. you know, but it's such a, for me. And I think for a lot of players that have achieved success at really high levels, um, it just isn't important. You know, it's not important for people to like it really true in the beginning of my career, whenever I was really insecure and I had a lot to prove and I wanted people to, um, look at me differently. I, that shit mattered a lot more to me, but once ever, once I got around people who think about things in the right way and they play poker because they like to compete and they like to think about the game, um, they're not, they're not in it for people to 
to tell them how good they are. They don't care. You know, yeah. you take a guy like Ike Hacks and he will be, he'll play every tournament. He'll play every cash game. He'll never tweet about a tournament that he won. Even if he won like 10 tournaments in a row, he doesn't care. You yeah. know, um, he just loves to play the game as much as anyone. And, and, and that shows. And I think a lot of guys like you and me respect a player like that yeah. because we see like one, you compete against them or, you know, or I compete against them and you realize, wow, this guy's a good player. And, and two, like, he, he doesn't care if we, if we tell everybody that he's a good player, you know? So, um, the advice that I would give people is make sure that you play poker because you really enjoy it because you, when you logged in and you started playing the game, hours just melted away and you were just lost in this place that you'd love to be in because that's the most important thing like that still to this day, like I was in Vegas this summer and I would be bored at my house and I would play a $500 world series of poker tournament on an iPad, like single tabling, just because I really like it, man. You know, I, I love to play poker and, um, and it's just a lot of, it's a game to me that I really like, I love and I have a ton of appreciation for. So that needs to be the, the thing for your work to be sustainable is that you love playing the game. Yeah. Um, and then the second most important thing is you have to work the right way. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. so make sure that, you know, like you were saying, talk to people that are better than you and just say, Hey, if you were me, I ask this question all the time. I, I like, I'll ask it to any professional, like, Hey, if you were me, and I wanted to get better at this thing that you're good at, what would you do right now? You know? So I think that that's a very, very important question to ask someone. Hey, uh, would you mind taking the time if you were, you know, yourself 10 years ago and you were just getting into poker, but you know, here's the tools that exist today and there's all this information, what would you do? And when they say something, actually listen, yeah. You know, actually take the, like, there's so many times I give people advice and I can tell they don't care about it. Like mm. they ask me, but they really don't want to take my advice. Yeah. I think maybe just they want to talk to Jason Kuhn and they don't really care. Yeah. About or they want the placebo of like, oh, I talked a hand with this guy. So now I'm better at poker. But it's like, mm. I can't, you, you know, like your, um, your training courses are incredible, but like a person can't just sign up for your membership and automatically be good at poker. Yeah. You know what I mean? They have to put in the work and yeah. there's nothing you can do for them. Yeah. Um, That's why I'm always so a big it, asshole in my intros to make people really aware of you. <laughs> you have to put in the work and you have to be really serious about this. And so they better not sign yeah, up. Yeah, And there's nothing magical about it. It's, yeah. it's just about being in the chair and, and trying to absorb stuff. Yeah. And also, don't let people who brag about all the work they do intimidate you. Cause I'll tell you one thing, all these people that say they study poker eight hours a day are completely full of shit. <laughs> like there's no way you get more than a good hour and a half to two hours of poker study before your brain melts. Yeah. You know this, I know this. I can't study poker for like an hour and I'm like, oh my God, I'm shocked. So don't let people say they're studying poker eight hours a day. They might be playing poker or watching poker, but you're not intensely yeah. studying poker yeah. eight hours a day. Yeah. I think a good metric to see how effectively you study is always whether you do it every two months or six months to really sit down and just for 10 minutes, write everything down you've learned, right? Okay. Mighty way pots in position. I got to be stabbing a little more on these boards. ICM final table in these boards. I have to do this. Oh, I learned I should be C betting more on this board. You don't need to write it write a fucking novel but this is like people if if you think about it and uh, the average poker player that watches streams watches youtube videos you run your own sims you probably invest hundreds of hours in consuming poker content and i'm pretty sure that most people won't come up with like 10 solid things they have learned over the last six months like really they can basically while they sleep they can shoot into the 10 different things that they have learned over the course of the last six months. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. right. Mm -hmm. So you need to differ differentiate between, okay, are you consuming poker content or are you learning? And learning requires mm -hmm. to sit down, turn your phone off, 
Don't be on social media, don't watch Netflix on the side, and even if it's just 20 minutes, and I think it gets harder and harder, and I actually read this in a book, and I think it's already quite, an, it's not so old, it's like 10 years ago, and this also has completely shifted my mindset and being way more mindful about consuming all sorts of distraction is, uh, money is important, resources in general, um, your, your knowledge, but in these days, and it's becoming more and more important, especially for employers, your ability to concentrate is becoming such a rare skill mm -hmm. in these days that you really want to be able to concentrate. I can see mm -hmm. it with the people I'm working with. I can see it with my students. If you can't concentrate, if you can't focus, you're not going to be able to learn such a complicated game. So really put in mm -hmm. some thought of, okay, what is my social media consumption can i still embrace boredom do i always need to take out my phone do i always need to yeah distract myself with something it will yeah. always ultimately correlate with the ability to study really in depth and as you said like eight hours is bullshit man just 30 minutes one hour a day four or five sure. times a week is totally sufficient running mm -hmm. two three sims trying Definitely. to figure out what, what what is happening here what are the exploits i can do but like this, mm -hmm. the way he was describing that in, the, in, in that book, man, I was just like really opening my eyes. Like he was really saying, this is gonna be a rare skill. Like it's literally becoming a resource. Having in your, if you yeah. build a company, hire the people that can concentrate. Yeah. Yeah, that's something uh, I observed that. And I, I was blessed with being raised on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And, and I had some dogs and I was outside all the time and I was sitting <laughs> on a lake fishing and like, that was like meditation to me as a six year old. Yeah. Um, and I did that until I was 18 and went to college. So I, I have find a lot of solace and peace and, and quiet moments when there's no TV on in the house. And I, I'm just sitting in my own thoughts. I, that's something I think I was naturally, uh, due to the circumstances of where I was raised. Yeah. I think, uh, <clears throat> kids nowadays won't, won't have that. You know, they're going to have to really work at having a still mind yeah, and yeah. being okay with, like you said, being bored, like bored, bored is, is a good thing sometimes, it, you know, there's is. a lot of stuff that you have to unpack that you don't even realize you're carrying. And the only way to do that is to be sitting in your own thoughts and mm. silence. Yeah. I remember when I was 12 and I was going to school and I was sitting in the tram for 20 minutes. There was nothing. I was just sitting in the window staring outside. <laughs> there was no problem. Yeah. I was like, right? That's, that's how right. it is. And I feel yeah. like also, I mean, you were raised in a farm and that's, that's great. So you have it essentially ingrained in your DNA to, you know, just embrace the peace and the calmness and you don't need to be distracted. I was raised in a city and at some point mid 25s when you know, social media become, is becoming more and more uh, popular, especially when you run a company, you know, you need to be active on social media. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to make a decision for myself to like, all right, I, I live in a city. It's of course we have some parks, but it's not the same thing as if you would be like deep in nature, you know. Uh, sure. I also f now with becoming older and older and being over 30, I feel way more connected to nature. It sounds like it's if I'm 80. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> But now, I, listen, like, don't have the time to do th two or three vacations a year. So I was like, okay, one of my vacations that I'm doing, I'm going to take it to go somewhere for a week. And just last year, I went to Iceland, uh, being in a just tiny cabin, no social media, nothing for a week, just to detox, just to mm -hmm. be getting used to it. I mean, you don't need to do it to such an extreme, but I don't think it takes a lot of your money. And like people, yeah, but I live in a city. I don't, I can't go to a nation. It's like, dude, like it doesn't take a lot of money to just go somewhere in a cabin, especially poker players who tend to have more money than, you know, the average working person, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you're already uh, a pro player. This is and this more is free a, time as well. And more free time, yeah. You can really work it around, and you can. I think it's a very wise investment. Yeah, I, I think at least from um, observing people in general, their discomforts and silence come because they feel anxiety because they have to think about mm. the current circumstances of their life, and it's like, look, that that means you should probably yeah. think about that. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not advocating psychedelics. I've done some psychedelics. I had a great time doing them. But one reason that people often say, Oh, I don't want to do have a, a psilocybin trip is because I'm afraid I'll go to dark places in my mind. And I'm thinking, 
well, you probably need to go to those places. You know, mm-hmm. you, that, that's stuff that you need to deal with. Yeah. Um, I think the human desire to constantly run from things that are uncomfortable uh, creates this this anxiety that a lot of us carry around. You yeah. know, um, you even if it's uncomfortable sitting in silence, sit there and, and embrace the discomfort and analyze why you feel the way you feel, mm. you know? It sounds so simple, and I think that's where people also sometimes get confused. Oh, that's it? There has to be something more. People message me on social media, Ben, meditation, like what am I supposed to do? What's, what's the technique? What's the protocol? There's nothing, dude. You just sit there, you shut the fuck <laughs> up and observe your mind. Yeah. You ob- of course, yeah. you have guided meditations on YouTube. I always recommend Headspace, great explanation, mm-hmm. a bit more background information on what is happening and why is it so powerful and what are the benefits. However, um, at the end of the day, it's not that complicated. And listen, like you were raised on a farm, so for you, it becomes more natural. I was raised in a city, so for me, it was always about action, you know, always something happening. I would still consider myself, I can concentrate and focus very well, but with time goes by and with social media becoming more dominant, I realize okay, I need to pay more focus on that. And uh, I probably have a harder time than you have just because the way I'm raised. So I might go to, for a week somewhere or have to put in more effort into that, right? So mm-hmm. we all have our shortcomings and something might feel a little easier than others or feel a little harder. So for everyone watching, I don't want you, okay, just because Ben CB is doing it, I should be doing that as well. So you need, you need to decide for yourself, okay, what feels easy for you, what feels a little harder, and then put the, the respective effort into these areas that might feel a little harder for you. And don't try to copy anyone uh, one-to-one. You can just you know try to take a little inspiration um, from what we're saying here. But I also sometimes feel like people, just because you and I, we have been successful in playing cards, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. You might have other areas where you should actually be putting way more focus on. But if you have a hard time focusing for five or 10 minutes on something, man, then you should probably take some advice from it. Definitely. Do you think playing poker, or let me phrase it this way. Do you think everyone can become a professional poker player? No. I think that most people can't become professional poker players. Um, of course, with, with studying and, and, and putting in the effort. Yeah, you, there you is say a you na- think there's so? a natural aptitude needed. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't necessarily, you know, that's something, and I've said this before in past conversations, it's something, you know, we all probably sit around and think how, you know, other than a lot of luck, like, really, how did I excel at my job? Like, how mm-hmm. did I do it, you know? It's like pretty obvious if you're LeBron James, why you excelled at basketball. You're six feet, eight, eight inches tall, and you can jump out of the gym and, you know, but, you know, as a poker player that plays a mind game, a competitive game, um, you know, I sit around and I think, oh, what attributes led me to being really good? And there were a lot of natural things that I had that other people don't have, but most of the stuff that I have, you could get with hard work, you know, And I think that almost everyone could be a somewhat competent poker player, but I think other than aptitude, it's just a personality thing that most people don't want, Mm. you know, that much risk, um, dealing with, uh, so much being out of your control. Like most human beings don't like that. They, they, they want something that's predictable. Yeah. What do you think was the aptitude or let's say the, the characteristic that helped you the most to become good in poker? Um, <clears throat> so a few things were, like I said, I really, really, really just naturally loved it. I don't know how mm-hmm. that happened, but this, the first time I was dealt a hand of poker, I was fascinated by it. Um, and then I've always, I, I like risk. I mm-hmm. like doing things that, you know, I'm done being like a daredevil, but like whenever I was in my teens and early twenties, I would do crazy stuff. You know, I jump off 30 meter lifts and just do crazy shit left and right. Um, but nowadays I don't like that, but I still like something that kind of gets the competitive juices flowing for me. So being naturally very competitive, liking risk, loving the game. And um, later in my career, just finding out how much I like being analytical. That wasn't something whenever I started playing poker, I didn't 
really consider how much I like to just break down things and think about why stuff works the way it works. But I think that that's, you know, for me, that's why there's nothing really very special about um, why I've excelled other than I have a lot of grit and I, I, I'm always very motivated Mm -hmm. somehow. I'm just naturally a very motivated person, self-motivated. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, especially that part that you mentioned, I think is, is, is extremely valuable and highly, highly neglected to look at who you are, what are your traits, what are your characteristics, especially the way you have been raised. If I look back into my upbringing, it was, I wouldn't say cold, but I'd say it was very rational. Okay. Think things through, you um, know, um, be smart about your decisions. And I can imagine that in a lot of different families, it's more emotional, emotionally. Mm-hmm. It also has some negative side effects. Like it took me years to really open up in relationships, to be very vulnerable and speak openly about my feelings. Because for mm-hmm. me, it was always, okay, you're supposed to be the man, you're supposed to be strong, you're supposed to be things, things through, you know, don't, don't let your emotions come into play, you know, uh, be rational. Of course, incredibly good for uh, being a poker player. For relationships, <laughs> was not necessarily the best thing, right? So I needed to yeah. learn along the way and also, helped me a lot working with guys like A.E. Rowe and, you know, be going on to that, even though I don't like this word a lot, like self-improvement uh, kind of journey, you know, to learn a little bit about, okay, I have this trait, I'm this person, where does it come from? Mm-hmm. And then it started making sense, right? And I feel like if there's a person who might have been raised in a very emotional way, that playing poker might be not necessarily your thing. Yeah, de- definitely. I mean, I was raised in a very emotional household, but I quickly learned that I wanted to win. And I realized <laughs> that there wasn't, and this is something that I've struggled with my entire career, but there isn't room for that. There, mm-hmm. there isn't room to let your emotions take over your mind. Yeah. And it was actually a great tool for me because I loved poker so much. It was a great tool for me to learn how to be more rational yeah. and to be more focused on processes rather than results. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, I think most people, if they didn't one, love it as much as I did. And two, just, I wanted to be a poker player. If they didn't really want that, I could see my personality type being horrible yeah. to, to signing up for, to be a poker player. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I remember I once had a student and uh, he really had issues uh, with the pressure and poker and he was very hard on, on himself and um, he, he was really good like when we had sessions he could usually explain things very well but in those moments he choked like he, he did terrible mistakes and he couldn't mm-hmm. explain why and especially when he was running deeper into in tournaments so it turned out that the way he was being um, raised is just very, very competitive. His dad was really hard on him. He was a tennis player. There was no room for mistakes. There was very little empathy. Mm -hmm. So of course it makes sense when you then start connecting the dots. So I was able to give him, um, I'm not in the position to to heal his wounds, but at least to give him some sort of push and say, listen, this is maybe something you need to work on to resolve or maybe speak with your dad or Mm -hmm. find a counselor that you know, you can you can uh, work with that stuff, accept it, and change your relationship to it, uh, because he had no that's clue right. why. It, it definitely has helped to understand where it comes from. I think that's that's a huge first step, um, and yeah. But I think that a lot of the problems we have on the poker tables are coming from somewhere, and the poker table simply amplifies that issue and brings it even stronger mm-hmm. to the um, uh, to the surface. One hundred percent, man. Yeah. Have you, um, have you had someone in your, in your, in your, I already talked about that, but maybe someone you have worked with who was able to, um, yeah, also work on uh, stuff that was holding you back in, in, in your career as a poker player mentally, or were you able to, uh, to overcome most of the obstacles, uh, for yourself and, and uh, what were the biggest obstacles for you? Um, so it's just been an ongoing, uh, process for me my whole life because it was more of kind of a blunt force trauma type obvious very obvious stuff I needed to work on I was very very bad at a lot of things due to um, the way I was raised and the chaos that surrounded me in my life Mm. Um, so you know a lot of people's 
struggles may not be obvious on the surface because oh, they yeah. have it together. But with me, it was very, very obvious what I needed to fix. It was like, hey, this guy should not be this mad right now, mm. you know, or, or, you know, definitely uh, it was <laughs> for me a very, very small, um, very, very small issue sometimes would cause me to react in a way that most people would react once in 10 years. Mm. You know, um, my body just instantly went into fight or flight way quicker than the average person. So I had to learn how to calm that and, and start to calibrate my body to react the way that it's supposed to react. Like, Hey, it's not fight or flight. If a guy cuts you off at a, at a red light, or if you lose aces, to Kings deep in a tournament, you know, this doesn't, it's not the same as something really, really bad happening. So I started working on that for years and, and my wife really helped me with that because she's, she's uh, like you, very rational and was raised in a very rational um, home and was just always very, very cool headed. Mm-hmm. So years and years and years of just me truly wanting to feel like a normal person and react like a normal person and, um, not carry around a bunch of baggage. I didn't want to be a damaged goods kind of guy. So I really worked at that hard. And then as of the last um, year, so this is very, very new, but I have worked with Elliot Rowe and he's been great. Mm. Um, He's, you know, I I would say in the last year, I'm much more just confident and calm and have dealt with most of my glaring personality flaws, but he's really helped me, like you said, get a deeper understanding of, yeah. why I feel these triggers in my body. Yeah. I once I was once working with a guy from London. He's he's not doing it anymore. And we had a session and he wanted to it was just more like body work and to resolve old stored emotions. And I'm very skeptical when it comes to that thing. And he wanted to make me cry our first set like literally the first session. And I was crying like a baby the first 10 minutes. I, I had no idea how he did it, where he was, he was, you know, touching certain points and also talking about stuff. And I was just answering. He, he was putting me in such a state. I had no control of it. Like, we have Crazy. no idea what kind of emotions are stored in our bodies and how, yeah. how much they can control us. And then, yeah. you know, as you said, we get mad about something. And then 10 minutes later, we're like, why, did, why am I doing this? And we consciously know it's bad, but we keep doing it. Yeah. I, I have this talk. I actually had this talk last night, I believe, with my wife about how much of our actions really are a result of free will and how <laughs> much of what we do is just Big kind topic. of the path we're on, you know? Yeah. And, and it's kind of it, it relates to like you were saying, like, how do you know if you're going to be a successful poker player or could you do play poker for a living? And honestly, like a lot of the stuff that makes me good or makes you good, that isn't just this innate, like built in aptitude, I think was kind of, and is kind of out of our hands. Like Mm -hmm. stuff that happened to you when you were seven or me, when I I was 10, you know, like made me just want to, I don't know, in some ways go the direction that I'm going. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my actions um, or attributes that people would consider noble or um, exceptional, I would say are really just kind of a result of the fortune of a lot of the misfortunate things that happened to me. You know, it's like I'm not really making the decision in a lot of these things. I just want to do the things that I want to do because of who I am or as a, a result of things that happened to me. Yeah. You know? I'd like to take all the credit for being good at poker or or doing this or doing that. But the truth of it is, it's just, I feel like a lot of this stuff is just, it just happens and you try to make the best that you can with what's happened and uh, be forgiving to yourself and love yourself and realize like, you know, a lot of this stuff is just kind of out of your hands and that's okay. Yeah. You know, just adapt and try to make good decisions and see what happens. Yeah. As you said, the the adapting part, I think is then, more crucial to the success where you take the responsibility for what has happened eventually exactly. finding meaning in it and this can be really bad stuff uh when they have been supernova elite i mean i needed to transist into a tournament poker like sit and go poker was gg my entire career was gg basically and could mm-hmm. be something like this could be tragedies in your family and 
also the stuff I've been working on and whether it was Ayat, whether it was someone else, they always turned me in something I also had to learn the hard way. It's like, listen, Ben, whatever shit has happened in your life or to everyone, you can keep sitting there and you can keep dwelling about it and mm. you can do that for the rest of your life or yeah. you take responsibility for it. Might not be your fault, yeah. but it's still your responsibility what you're going to do out of it. Whether you have lost yeah, you a loved one, you whether you can't let your identity. A yeah. lot of people let their identity be the thing that happened to them. Yeah, and that's bullshit. You know, yeah. that's a cop out. Like, like I know it's easier said than done, but you don't want to let your illness be your identity of a person, yeah. right? or your your tragedy be your identity. That's just a, a thing that redirected you. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel especially that part when it comes to taking the responsibility is what a lot of people are lacking moving on forward. And I also have the impression that very often, and I've seen that myself over and over again, using that as an excuse to not move on, to not take risks, to fall into that victimhood mentality, to say, mm -hmm. oh yeah, this has happened to me. Life is so unfair. I'm not going to try because it's going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen that I will fail or you know, because of political circumstances, because of certain laws. Oh, yeah, poker is going to be uh, restri restricted in my country. Oh, yeah, I was working so hard. You see, it happens again. And mm -hmm. to predict that into the future without this happening anyway, yet. And this is where I think um, it's it's so easy. And I can see that on, on a micro level, on a day-to-day -day basis, like, oh, it's going to be a bad day anyway. Let's just, you know, not do it. Oh, and this business meeting, it's going to be boring. Like, oh, let's get over it, you know? And you predict it. And then it's really going to happen, actually. Or you just, okay, I'm not going to enjoy it, but it's a necessity. Let's go through it. Let's take responsibility, whatever it is. And it's just something that I, at least for myself, I've seen... Um, a big difference in when I succeeded or when I failed in something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that one thing that I, I also did to being more forgiving to yourself and when, when you suck at things is yeah. like, if I'm having a day where I just, my brain's broken mm -hmm. or I'm in a bad mood or something happened and put me in a bad mood, I just always think, okay, I'm going to sleep this off. And then the next day I'll probably be better, you know? So it's just like be more forgiving in that way too, where it's just like control the damage. Don't let something kind of spiral into this big issue that it doesn't need to. If you just like shut your mouth, take a walk, sleep it off, wake up and start over, you know, yeah. um, grit through some stuff. Maybe you're not going to be as good, but just get a couple things done. So you feel good about it. Go to yeah. sleep and just continue, man. Yeah. I, I agree on that. I think, just having the ability to, to forgive yourself is something that we, um, I also myself uh, need to work on that. I might just have oh, a bad yeah, Sunday, one bad Sunday, like I doubt my entire poker skills. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not yeah. playing poker anymore. <laughs> oh yeah. Or if, like, if you like misplay, you make a, like a big deviation from something that, you know, like here's a perfect example. Um, on high stakes poker this year, there was a guy I was playing with who I'd never played with before but he was all over the place. Hmm. I mean, it was like, it was just, he was a madman, but he was like all over the place. And I- oh, Wasn't it one of the this, biggest pots? Uh, was, no, it, wait. It was a pretty big pot. It was like 300K or something, 200K. Okay. But it's weren't you also involved like in, in, weren't you involved, or am I, am I uh, confusing it? Weren't you involved in like one of the biggest pots over the last years, was it? Oh yeah, yeah. I, was you at um, Ace-Queen? Yeah, yeah, and then I had yeah, in like two hands in succession. It was just the stakes of the game. Yeah, um, that was on a Triton game. Yeah, but but let's talk about yeah. that hand that you wanted to talk about first. Yeah, so there there was this hand that I played, and whatever I, I won't say spoilers because I don't think it's been aired yet. But like, I decided to make like a pretty ambitious call on the river because my assumptions of this guy were. Uh, that he was just random and that my cards were more powerful than they would be in a normal situation. And I made like a pretty big call down. Um, and whatever he had, he had the, basically the nuts and I lost, but I was so like mad at myself about it, even though in the moment it was like the best that I could do. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, like if, and 
to show how broken your brain is, I was so mad at myself about it, yet like two orbits later, he completely lifted a hand in, like total zero, like crazy bluff for like a bigger pot than the one that I just played with him. Yeah. So it was like, like zero equity, zero blockers, just like got backed himself into a corner and just, you know, did the thing. Mm. So it was like, so I was somewhat validated in my decision that like, oh yeah, I probably did good there, but I was still pissed off at myself for like a day, mm. you know? So it's, it's just one of those things. I think that's just an ego thing. Yeah. You know, it's just the ego of like, oh, I'm under this, the judgment of every person that watches TV and I'm this person and, and I'm not allowed to make mistakes or I'm not allowed to make a big exploit and be wrong. Mm. You know, it's just all <laughs> bullshit. It's all tied to your ego. Yeah. You know, what's funny is actually that just having that conversation and you sharing that story just raised my confidence level from here to here. Cause yesterday, <laughs> yeah. yesterday I had three spots against Mike Edemo and he always had it against me. And I also <laughs> had three big hands and I folded once I called twice. Uh, And he beat me three times. And I, afterwards I was like, maybe he's not bluffing against me. Maybe, I don't know, he's on a net, different level. And then I was talking to other players like, dude, there was just nothing you can do there. It's just coolers. You know, yeah. you have you have a straight twice, or you have a st straight twice, straight over bigger straight, straight over flush for 25 big blinds and top pair against not straight and another sport blind for his blind. So it's like just hearing you makes me f calm down a bit more. Because you think yeah, about these spots that and, that's, same stuff. and that's why you mentioned at the beginning, just having those people, it doesn't necessarily does need to be a super in-depth GTO strategy talk. It's just about sharing similar experience because then you fall into that trap thinking, oh, everyone is so great. They're emotional, rob uh, they're non-emotional robots. They're just, you know, perfect GTO machines. <laughs> that's not the case, dude. Right. So no. just having these talks and having someone that is on a, on a similar journey will also calm you down and, and you will regain confidence and momentum. Definitely. We all, and we all struggle with that stuff, you know, but it, the, the guys, and I, I hate to keep bringing up Ike as an example, but he's a guy that like, I just, as a professional poker player, I, I admire so much because he's so rational and he's so consistent and he's also very good. Um, but he is so quick to forgive himself about something like mm. he'll do something that, you know, he may later say was a huge punt, but he doesn't, it doesn't affect his confidence that he's a good poker player. It's yeah. just a thing that he did because in the moment it was the best that he could do. Yeah. You know, and that's something like if you didn't sleep well or you feel like shit or, you know, you ate bad or, or let's just say stuff that's out of your hands. Like you couldn't sleep well the night before. And then the next day you get up and you play and you don't play well. Well, you shouldn't really be mad at yourself for that. Yeah. You no, know? it's just, it was one of those nights you didn't get good sleep. So just, your mind was what it was where it could be and and you did your best so yeah. it's like i think it's just one of those things just we all mess up in big ways and you just got to move on man yeah absolutely i feel like you're just being a mentor for me for the last 10 minutes and <laughs> this is i think a great illustration of okay sometimes you know you just got to be the student you just got to listen you just got to take in what the other side has to say and it's like a back and forth when you when you have friends or poker buddies and you know one day you got to be the mentor the next day you got to be the student and maybe at some day you're on a similar level and you just share experiences Always. right and yep. um it's 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 a pleasant talking to you and i also believe about it's it's so much more fun to share pun stories than just random bad beat stories so <laughs> if you have a good pun if you sit on a bonfire or you know you have a night out with your friends and you have a drink or two Then you at least has, you have something to share. I remember when I get together with new poker players, I remember last year when I met Americs and European, we were talking about pun stories. It was actually so fun. That is a good, that's a yeah, good time. That's always a good story to share. <laughs> don't, don't share your bad beat shit, man. Nobody wants to hear that. But mm -hmm. um, your pun stories are great. I mean, if, it, if you make it in a constructive way, right? Where's the hand? Maybe you have gotten a feedback. I mean, sometimes you have to let steam off. I think that's fine. Go go to bodies like, listen, like it's going shit, like go on a rant for 10 minutes, but then say, listen, enough, we can move on. Yeah. It's also part of the journey. Definitely agree with here. that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I just- For sure, just don't be the victim. Yeah, yeah. It's it's about the way you are sharing it, right? It's the, about, the, about the, the, I don't want to say the art of sharing a bad beat story, but like, 
you know, if you come from a place of frustration and just victimhood mentality, I feel like it gets a bit, it gets awkward. Oh, it does. And then the second you suck out on someone, you're sitting there like, oh man, you like feel bad about it because you've just been complaining about how unlucky you were. Yeah. You know, it's just like such a toxic mentality. Just, just keep trucking, man. Yeah. I think also streaming has helped me a lot there to not fall into that trap, especially if you have a couple of people watching you. Do not complain about it. Just so careless and like, let's move on. You know, no, yeah. nobody, nobody's here to hear your bad, bad beat stories. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's amazing that you guys do that. I love watching those streams. Thank you, man. I really enjoy it. Yeah, you, I really enjoy it. Have you considered streaming yourself? <laughs> no, I'll never stream. I mean, I might stream like for <laughs> never a say never. or something. Yeah, I just, um, it's, uh, it's just something that whenever I play, I, I, I can't communicate with other people and play at the same time. Okay. I just can't. Yeah. I just have to be like lasers, you know? Yeah. I've learned it very early on. I was one way to study for me was to record my own session, speak out my thoughts and then just ups, uh, afterwards, just listen to my recording and just hear my thought process and identify mm. um, <clears throat> leaks or where I'm, you know, making up fantasy reasons to justify my bullshit yeah, call Yeah, flaws in logic and stuff. Yeah, yeah, you can definitely do that. Yeah. What was usually your study routine? Were you someone you said you were more feeling based player, especially when you used to play heads up? How is it more in these days? Um, solvers or what's your yeah how, is it, how you definitely it? um so <laughs> the typical stuff probably just a little more organized just solver work but aggregating all of my studies and um i really learn things sorry to interrupt aggregating you mean like keeping track having an archive or yeah okay. having an archive of basically everything that i've ever <clears throat> studied mm -hmm. and and having uh, organized ways to reference it and go back so yeah just having a bunch of words that I can search or shortcuts. Like one thing that I like to do personally is something similar to what you were talking about earlier. I have a giant um, Jason's Poker for Dummies archive basically. And it's just like every mechanic that stands out to me that like, um, just like random. Um, so I would be like, okay, uh, with shorter SPRs, whenever I'm betting the turn, I want to be more polar in this spot or I want to have I don't want the flush draw blocker. I do want the flush, flush draw blocker, whatever. Whatever the little mechanic is that I see in a specific spot, like, oh, I want more equity to bet this spot. I want less equity and I want to be more polar to bet this spot. I will make a, a basically a dummies for note, just a little sentence of like a mechanic that I saw, you know, like, oh, you don't want the flush draw to, block, to bluff here, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll just have like lists of hundreds of different nuggets of thoughts that yeah. popped into my head. Yeah. Um, and I just add to that list over and over and over again. And then on top of that, you know, I keep track of just spreadsheets of frequencies and sizings and average bet sizes, whatever volume, just standard stuff. Yeah. Um, just, but I'm very visual in the way that I, I learn. So I do a lot of kind of heat mapping, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I do a lot of, that type of study I and mean, just yeah I have giant notebooks basically saved yeah it's actually really interesting I've read it somewhere as well that you have different learning types right the visual audio and feeling so you also need to figure out for yourself what kind of uh, study type you are so whether like with heat maps or through audio or talking to someone just you know yep. getting some emotions up there and <clears throat> getting back that confidence um you need to try it out. I feel like some people are studying those dry charts over and over again, but they're actually not that type of person to, to study that way. Yeah, I, I think it's way more important, way, way more important to just sit around and try to learn mechanics, try to try to learn why, you know, just rather than trying to like memorize a solver strategy, just say, what, why is it doing that? You know, why, why does it like to have this suit and this suit? And then try to identify, and it's not always like some patterns are really, really random and hard to find. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, a lot of stuff is really consistent. Yeah. You know, like like when you want to check raise with the back door, or when you want to check raise without the back door, and check call with the back door. Or, you know, all of these different 
uh, mechanics. When do I want to fast play my top pair? Do I want the uh, the kicker underneath of the top pair or do I want the kicker over top of the top pair? You know, things like that. Yeah. Um, and then just identifying loads and loads of different mechanics help you execute at, at a really high level and also just make your misses less damaging. You know, that's really the mm. most important thing is just, just miss less. Mm -hmm. Like your mistakes need to be a little smaller, you yeah. know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm always a big fan of that. Just trying to make less mistakes in your opponent, just getting rid of the blunders in your game. You know, you will have exactly. deviations from the norm. Like I'm not striving to uh, necessarily like the perfect frequencies or the perfect suits, you know? Even if this yeah. combo is supposed to be bluff, let's say you're supposed to bluff 10-9 off, but it's it's a more high frequency bluff with 10-9 in diamonds and 9 in clubs, but like 10-9 in, 10 in spades and 9 in hearts is still a reasonable bluff. I'm not going to be sitting there. I sometimes exactly. see in our Discord community people like writing novels about a spot that will improve the AV yeah. by 0 0.0005. Like, yeah. What the fuck, yeah. dude? Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, it says 10-9 off is a reasonable bluff, 75% of the time. I think it's more important to look into, okay, is it realistic that your opponent is coming to to the road with that specific range? So sure. does your bluff make sense? Because very often they totally neglect that and the range looks completely different in reality. So yeah. They should be talking about that and maybe they are going to have way more faults because they're not check raise bluffing enough. They're not, you know, having mm -hmm. these ace high check raise for protection on flop and turn. So their range is actually weaker on the river. Focusing yeah. on that, gaining more forward equity, even adding 9-8 to their, to their range. And this is, the, I think, the crucial part where then you can really start making exploits. You have that standard mm -hmm. game plan that you can work with. And then from there, you make expl uh, ex your exploits. I mean, what you're saying there is just playing poker better than other people. You know, yeah. that yeah. that's what you're doing is you're understanding the way the game works and you're not looking at an image and trying to do the thing the image says. You're just, I understand mm -hmm. the nuts and bolts that's... of the game. I think this guy does this too much or too little, so I'm going to do this. Yeah. And that's what makes a great poker player. And you have to have confidence mm -hmm. to do that. And the only way to do that is to push yourself into being especially in the beginning into being a little too spewy in spots or too stationy in spots or, you know, you should never be too, too little in the beginning. Like you should always be too much of something, mm. you know, if you're doing too little, it, especially like at low stakes in the beginning, you have to be a maniac at some point. <laughs> to it, you know, you just absolutely have to be because you have to realize where to taper it off and like mm. what works and what doesn't work. And the okay. only way to do yeah. that is to push boundaries in the beginning, you know? Yeah. I really like the way you were describing it, not trying to learn an image. That's, I think, exactly. that, that's, that's a very strong illustration of the way most players are studying these days and then wondering why they're not improving. Just, you know, looking yeah, at images, like, it's all a, right, yeah. Yeah, it's not fun to learn that way either. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's really fun to be in the streets, you know, and that's what you're saying is like, the best players are, are the ones that can just, you give them a random poker problem to solve instantly and they will guess pretty well at it. They won't yeah. just say, oh, well, the cutoff opens this and this is this, you know, they'll be able to figure it out. They'll solve it in their head, mm -hmm. at least somewhat closer than the average person will, because you're not repeating uh, data. You're, you're critically thinking about something and then adjusting to it well. Yeah, Absolutely. People that might say, well, I don't have the experience yet to determine what my opponent might come to the river with, which ra range my opponent might come to the river with. Well, then it's, we talk about experience, right? You need to put in the hours and actually, playing. Really, yeah, playing. And it's, it's a good point that you brought up that you, you have to test your limits, right? You have to, sometimes you will overstep your boundaries, but then it's important to be very self-critical and like, all right, my, I might be over bluffing in this spot. I remember like five, six years ago when solvers weren't really a thing when i was playing cash games or sitting goals i think like, in these days i would be such a fish in these games i would just oh yeah you know it was back then you would bluff catch or bluff bluff catching was not really a thing like you didn't beat any value you fold so you would just bluff everything especially deep on a tournament sitting like you know your opponent is kept all in all in Black blockers who cares like you know 
he can't have aces kings you can't have the straight on this board you just would go bananas that's how i played like five six years ago and these days i would be on biggest biggest whale on, on my stakes and it's just how crazy the game has has uh, shifted towards yeah um, a more <clears throat> let's say at least a more range aware game and if i wouldn't have tested my boundaries like i would have never you know see how far i can i can push it and also in other spots in these days i feel like icm wise multi way there's still spots where i think you can push it really far or you have to be incredibly tight because people don't understand how right tight ranges are and they just don't like to fold yeah that's that would be my observation from the very small amount of hands that i've played in online mtt's uh people don't like as to fold? of recently well it's like not only do they not like it's it's a very weird meta, I feel like. I feel like the average reg isn't very intense and doesn't find the right amount of bluffs basically anywhere. Yeah. Yet they defend almost like at what an equilibrium strat would defend at. Um, so it, it feels weird to me because they're not, the aggressors are finding, you know, a great player like Adamo is finding the bluffs and forcing you to call the river in spots, you know, mm -hmm. and you're, you're pretty happy to call the river against a player like him or Chidwick with a hand that's worth a couple big blinds against a bot, right? But like, there's so many spots that I noticed, um, like I played this, uh, this Venom tournament, this ACR Venom the other day. And great there's structure, a spot huh? where, there was, yeah, and there, <laughs> this is like the exact, this is the exact situation I, I'm talking about. So I open aces from like mid position with 40 bigs and it comes seven, seven, five, uh, rainbow check. I check back. The turn is a Jack bringing a flush draw. It goes check. I bet like, what was the flow like? Pot, seven, seven, five rainbow. Mm -hmm. So I have aces, it goes check, check, I have like 40 bigs. And um, the turns of jack, it goes check, half pot, really small check raise on the turn where I'm already like, like <laughs> this guy like literally never has the bluff, but I have fucking aces I call, maybe he just has king jack or something, I don't know. Yeah. And the river's a king and he bets half pot, which isn't a thing, like, like you know, it's a, it's like the most obvious thing in the world to me that the, the guy's saying, well, I want to bet an amount where he's going to call, you know, like where really the guy's value range there is mostly just trips or bluffs. So he's just all in or check on the river. Maybe like you bet a King or something for some size that's in between that. Yeah. Um, but like the meta of the way that these guys play, I just, I was just like, I, I'm going to call half pot every time with aces and I'm never going to be good here ever. You know, like, like ever, but I call my hand and I lose the trips or whatever. And it's just like, there's certain spots where most players just aren't fl finding like the, ch the flush draw check raise there, the open ender check raise there, but they'll always find the trips and then they'll pick a size that isn't right. I know this is long winded, but I just feel like people call the river a lot, but they don't bluff the river a lot mm. in the current mm, yeah. states of online <laughs> poker, unless they're a good player. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I agree on that. Yeah. Not, I also would say that they're not consider their or value their tournament life enough. I feel like I just had so many deep runs where I was finding two, finding three tables and people just punting it off left and right. Like sometimes I got six without without really like winning a lot of chips. Yeah, I've noticed that too. It's like they just play chip EV ranges everywhere, you know? And even post-flop, it's like, I, I noticed that a lot of people are like studying like PO Sims at final tables. And I'm just like, what are you, what are you, you can't do that. Yeah. Like what do you do? Chip values are non-linear. You can't study a chip EV model like two out of the money in a poker tournament, you know? Yeah. No, absolutely. It, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, poker's really hard and poker tournaments are very, very hard. So yeah. I think we have a long ways to go until they're like very hard to beat, especially yeah. at the mid stage. And that's good. And that's good because it you know, keeps the game so complex and gives everyone a fair chance to catch up. I mean, if you want to study ICM, post-flop, study final tables, given the infinite amount of diff possible stack size distributions, it takes you weeks yeah. to really, you know, yeah. get good at it. And at the so same time, I'll... you need to neglect other areas. You can't study multi-way at the same point 
uh, you can't study triple barrel and bluff or blind versus blind because, you know, and that's something you have to accept. So you always have to pick the areas that I think you feel the least comfortable with or where the money, most money is at. And I always advise people, try to study the spots that are the hardest to study. Um, Mighty Way, ICM, uh, PKOs, where just with a little bit of effort, just grasping the main concepts, you will gain a massive edge. To catch up with the top players, see betting in position, you need to study that much. And it's not like so much money to, to earn there. Like, okay, you can bet 25%, you can bet 30%, yeah. you can bet 66% and betting a lower frequency. The EV difference is not gonna be that much. There are a few boards, of course, where you can make exploits because people are not check raising enough, so you should choose a larger size with our value, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you compare all these topics, I believe that there are topics where you can gain way more EV by studying less and getting a higher reward out of it. Yeah, one, um, <laughs> the one area that I've noticed that helped me greatly to improve with my study and my work <clears throat> was to go to places where I wasn't the, my range wasn't greatly in front with EV and mm. pot share. Yeah. Like go places like where it, it's check check on the flop and then the, the turns probed by the out of position player. And now yeah. you're the in position player facing a turn probe, which is, you know, not as easy as like, oh, I get 90% of my range, see bets the flop. So I'll just like study this spot where it's like, you yeah. can't really screw up, you know? Yeah. But if you play like a three bet pot in a check check spot, you can make massive mistakes. Yeah. You know? So I think going to places where, yeah, they're just maybe lower reach in general, but just much more difficult because you don't have all the pot share. You can learn a lot about poker that way. Yeah. So essentially studying more the boards that are not connecting with your, yeah, I like I like that idea. I really like that idea where let's say the board is eight, five deuce or, you know, seven, four, yeah. three, like these kind of boards where you're supposed to be checking back way more often. Yeah, uh, or like a mono <clears throat> board and a three bet pot, like something mm. that's like really hard and tricky to play, you know, yeah. like stuff like that. Um, yeah. I think you can get a, a, a greater edge overall than learning like Oh yeah, I'm supposed to bet 110% pot on this flop, like, and not bet 70. It's like, you know what I mean? It's a, you're not giving yeah. up much there. Yeah, for sure. That's great advice. I love that. Gonna be studying more these boards. Actually, yeah, it's 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 really smart. Um, well, I think also like paired boards. You know, it's like, how many check races and triple barrel bluffs have you seen on pair boards? I think well, this, this, after this conversation, we're going to see tons. <laughs> <laughs> I have shared so much, dude. Like I play uh, on Twitch. I'm telling people exactly how I play. People just uh, don't want to adapt. I think it's just yeah. most players are not going to sit down and do the work. So I'm not really afraid. Yeah. But it's also something, you know, when you just think about it. Okay. Paired boards. Facing a check race and a triple barrel on in with a random bluff. Let's say seven, seven deuce, and someone goes bananas with ace four, blocking ace seven, or like let's say ace eight. You know where you block eight seven suited, where you block ace seven suited. People are not going to do that. You know they have here and there they have their bluffs and rather small pots, maybe two street bet, um, where some busted draws. But usually where you have to be a bit creative, you don't need to run huge database analysis, you can just think about, okay, how often have I seen bluffs in these spots? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe once like better, blue. way more important. Yeah, for sure. Are you studying uh, short deck also with solvers or how does your studying look? <coughs> in, yeah, uh, I mean, in the, in the beginning, um, you know, short deck is, is very different altogether because I have to be a lot more creative with my studies because there aren't, you know, there's, there's not all the answers <laughs> out there, but you, you still can, get a feel just free handing stuff and learning equities and, and card removal. If you can guess well at preflop ranges, that's one re also another reason I love playing short deck is because there's not great tools out there. So mm. you're just in the streets, you know, you're <laughs> just sitting down like on a four way board, like just in the streets playing poker with people. Yeah. Um, so a lot of uh, what's amazing about short deck is um, basically every time I play the game's entirely different based on who's sitting at the table. So you're just very, very quickly trying to figure out what you're going to do that day. And mm. it's never the same. Yeah. Um, 
So it, it's really, really fun. You know, one guy can just completely change everything. Yeah. Um, it, it's really, really cool. I, I've had a lot of fun with that. That re- I wasn't burning out on No Limit Hold'em. It, I still love No Limit Hold'em, but it did kind of reignite a flame for me of learning something new and it being really weird and hard and constantly changing <clears throat> and getting to play big games. So yeah, yeah, um, so yeah this, the studying element's still not the same as, as like looking at PO or whatever, but there's still so much to be learned. And you get to play against the player pools in the biggest games are quite small. So you play against the best competition of the time mm-hmm. and you kind of see what they're up to and you learn from each other. Yeah. And there's some stuff that just kind of fits. Yeah, for sure. This literally reminds me of the early days of studying tournament poker. The yeah, usual, the awesome. usual way of analyzing a hand would be someone presents a hand and then I open it. I think he didn't have it. The next one, I uh, think he had exactly. it. <laughs> That's the, was the yeah. way it was. He had this much, so he probably had it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What was really fun for like two months uh, this spring, we played tournaments on an app. We played short deck tournaments every day um, on an app that ranged from like 12K US to like 75K US rebuys. Mm -hmm. Um, Short deck every single day for like two months. It was so much fun. It was insane, man. I can't believe it. Um, A lot of people got a lot better. And there's just so many spots that it's very, very like. Short deck is crazy in tournaments. You want to talk about, like, I would, honest to God, I would teach you the rules of pre-flop and post-flop in short deck, and I would stake you in high stakes uh, short deck tournaments tomorrow just because you understand the way ICM works. Yeah. Um, and there's so many spots in uh, in short deck where Aces has 66% equity, and it's just a pure fold pre mm-hmm. uh, against, like, a guy ripping it on the bubble whenever, you know, you're one and two in chips, you know? So he just shoves 100% of hands and you can't call aces. Mm. Uh, you know, there's just crazy spots like that where a guy will just snap you off with ace king off. <laughs> and he's like 55% against any two or something in short deck, you know? Yeah. So it's like, uh, they're just huge ICM punts in short yeah. deck. Huge. I had, a, I had a deep run la- yeah, last year in uh, one of the scoop tournaments. I think there was like a 2K short deck. Oh. Um, and I... I know the basics and I was playing some cash games and uh, I realized pretty quickly, like you can't really call a lot there. And we were in the money and some guy also ripped like, I don't know, 40, 50 bigs on me with Jack 10 suited. I had ace king. Um, I called and was out. Um, Yeah, you're an underdog. And and this, (laughs) (laughs) this, this, are you an underdog with ace king against Jack 10? Yeah. Yeah, Jack 10 suited is a favorite. Oh, wow. Yeah, Jack 10 is pretty strong, right? It's really strong, yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, but since I didn't give myself an edge like that much, and it's it's not the biggest field, of course you have the best, and uh, I wanted to learn more about short deck, especially tournament, and I thought, you know, a bit of ICM understanding, uh, next pie jump was quite a far away, but like anything close to, like I think I've just folded everything on the bubble. Like I realized oh, yeah. you actually can't play a single hand. Yeah. Ace King is uh, like kind of the magic hand too. And um, short deck where it <clears throat> has to call off a bunch because it's never in bad shape. Uh, it's 45% against Kings. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah, like, it's also insane, yeah. so it's, and you just crush, you know, you don't crush, but if the guy shoves ace X, you're in really good shape. Yeah. And I actually also thought that, you know, Jack 10, you know, most people would naturally, especially with a no limit hold in background, it's so natural to just call uh, yeah. I, I think, but I think this guy was also pretty good in short deck, so yeah. it's just okay. I lost against a better opponent. That's fine. So yeah, it's uh, a fun game, man. Yeah, for it's sure. It's a fun game. Yeah, looking forward to uh, the next series that are coming up. How do you think? And uh, that's uh, the last topic I want to touch base on. I mean, we have to ask, uh, we have discovered or talked about so many very interesting topics, which I'm very grateful for. Um, the the current situation of of online poker. Uh, I mean. There is a series almost every single week, right? Uh, whether it's on GG, whether it's on Poker Stars, Party Poker, has it also led you to be less excited to play online tournaments, or is it something that you are actually feeling good about, or feeling positive that there is such a wide variety of, of offers currently in the landscape of online poker? <laughs> um. Well, I, I, yeah, I love the fact I'm more of like a, at least for tournaments, more of a recreational player now, you know, like, like 
I'm not saying that I am not like, I think I could be very, very, very good in, in no limit hold'em tournaments very quickly, but I don't play them online. <clears throat> like since those 25 Ks that ran on uh, GG, like a year and a half ago, I haven't really played online tournaments other than just for fun or a Sunday or whatever. I'm not saying I'm not winning. It's just, I it, approach it less concerned about the, okay. um, the entire environment, yeah. you know? Fair enough. Um, but it, but it feels like a cash grab to me. I, I feel a little worried mm-hmm. um, just by observing it. It doesn't seem like it's sustainable. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Um, it's it's quite aggressive, especially from GG. If you just you know, you offer so many tournaments, you essentially <clears throat> saturate the market by uh, decreasing the buying power, where not everyone is going to have the money to afford buying in for all of the tournaments, like. A couple of years ago on Sunday, you had a couple of 1Ks and 2Ks, that's it. Like now you have so many 2Ks, 5Ks, 10Ks every weekend. I think you yeah, had like crazy. three 10Ks a year. And the yeah. money has to come from somewhere. It's not that suddenly exactly. poker players have more money. So you essentially <clears throat> decrease the EV or de- 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 decrease, the per- decrease the perceived value of all of the tournaments because now the player pool starts separating. And you've seen that in, in this year where poker stars, uh, poker stars started having overlays in one of their major tournaments. It has never happened before, right? And I think also one reason is and one big problem is that GG is so aggressive with their tournaments, like insane rebuys uh, down to Mm -hmm. like 10 big blinds, unlimited rebuys. And it just creates a false expectations of um, the value of the tournament. It it looks like a huge guarantee, but like think about how uh, they're achieving it. It's it's yeah. not healthy it's just for the all like super pros being in for five bullets each. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 definitely not sustainable. It, there's a lot of things um, about the way that that site's doing business that seems somewhat um, like the whole threatening to ban people for being bum hunters uh, seems really really crazy and arbitrary. Like yeah. like I, I I don't think that you could ever ban a guy for game selecting. Yeah. And then like using your opinion to decide if he was a bomb hunter or not. That just yeah. doesn't, that doesn't seem cool. I think there just needs to be something transparent. Like you have to have clear rules about it. You have to be like, okay, yeah. if you join 10 cash game tables, three or seven out of 10 times, whatever the metric might be, you have to start a table. We yeah. won you once, maybe twice. If you transgress against it, we're going to ban you. And then everyone knows yeah, what's going on. That seems more than fair, for sure. And that's not difficult, man. Like, we can fly to the moon. You can, like, yeah. GG, like, please don't tell us that this, ah, it's too difficult. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, like, the pros that are just nasty vultures of players who they just, they don't deserve to play on the site. But yeah, there needs to be something transparent and a black and white rule of like, you do this, you get banned. Not like, hey, we think you won too much money and you're we don't like you on our site. Like it just I don't know. It it put a bad taste in my mouth. I, at least back in the day it always felt like really good at poker and you held the tables and you could beat everyone. That was an admirable thing. Yeah. You know? But nowadays it's like, Oh, you're you're too good to be here and we'll see you later kind of yeah. thing. Just I don't I don't dig that. Yeah. I like that there's a serious competitor for poker stars however on the other side poker is always being a game for players trying to win and you're communicating essentially that you're a poker side you're not there for winners i mean why would you sign up there in the first place yeah if you <laughs> that's that's how i felt about it yeah I, it, it was just i don't know obviously i'm biased because i'm a professional poker player but i don't know man <clears throat> it, being good at poker is is admirable it's cool yeah yeah absolutely um has concerned me for a very long time as well i stopped playing on gg for a very long time however i also felt that people then at the end of the day that's just the way poker players are don't care about it you yeah. know they they keep playing on these sites so you um, got to go take the money you know that's that's your job is to go take the money yeah they're gonna hand it to you you gotta go take it that's yeah that's how i've always felt too there's a lot of situations where um, yeah, I, I, I talk to people that understand <clears throat> the, the career better than me. And they're like, look, will you get paid if you win? Are you being cheated? Yes. No, go play, go take the money. All mm-hmm. right. 
you know, and that's it. Yeah. Do you think there's still like, I mean, you, you probably don't don't know for sure, but like just based on the way you perceive the game, so how you feel and what you've experienced, do you think there's a lot of cheating going on in general? Um, so I've been cheated before on apps and it was really obvious to me and, and um, we figured it out pretty quickly. Uh, was it a group with, of people sharing cards with card removal effects? Yeah, there, mm. uh, basically everything. I, I mm. was cheated once where a team broke into my hotel room, put a virus on my computer, saw oh, my wow. cards, beat me out of a bunch of money. Then that was actually on full tail poker. And then um, I was cheated how did by you, groups of cool. How? Sorry to interrupt. How, how did you uh, <laughs> figure, figure, that out? figure it out? Yeah. Well, I was playing a guy in 5K heads up <coughs> sit and goes, and he was playing horrible and just demolishing me. Um, and then I asked Ben Collarine to look at the database, and he's just like, this just doesn't make sense. He's like, he does like a few things that you can never do basically and win. And he just never calls the river and loses basically. Um, and then we figured out it was uh, that Peter Jepson team. Um, It was those guys I went and had my computer looked at and there was a Trojan on my computer. Uh, these guys found it. And then I emailed poker stars and full tilt and they froze some assets of a couple guys. It was the same guys that broke into the Barcelona room, hotel rooms and tried to get Scott Seaver and Doug Polk back in the day. Mm -hmm. I was just the first guy to get got and it took me losing to figure it out. It was just the way that he played. He was perfect. He never went all in preflop. He waited till the river always. Okay. Um, so the online mic river. poster. Version. Yeah, exactly. It was sick. Um, yeah, so that happened to me once. Uh, Did they catch I've the been against the Yeah, he's in prison. Oh, really? For um, that or yeah. other stuff as well? A, a bunch of that. A bunch okay. of that, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I was colluded against. And then one time I was even super used where a guy hacked an algorithm of an app and beat me for uh, seven figures. Mm. So it was, it was crazy. Um, yeah, it was like, it was me and a group of other guys and, uh, a prominent online professional poker player figured it out and, and had the guy banned, but it was too late. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten uh, your money back in any of those no, instances? No, no never. Yeah. Not even from the poker sites. So like when you get cheated. Full tilt gave me, I, I mean, when they were to the confiscate day, the money and freeze his account and give, give you the funds back. Yeah, but he already cashed it all out ah, and punted okay. it. And, um, yeah. yeah, it was, it was a mess, man. Yeah. But yeah, I've seen it all. And basically, uh, I played those, those games, the tournaments, those 25 K's that a lot of people said there was probably collusion and I didn't feel it. Um, you mean I, on GG? I know, Yeah, I won a lot in those games and um, and a lot of other of the really strong players won a lot. And, and it was over a huge sample, I, like a huge, huge sample. And a lot of the best players won a lot. And of that group, I mean, it was no surprise. It was like Adamo won, Ike won, like, um, you know, just good players that you would think would win won. Hmm. Um, so maybe there was collusion, but I didn't feel it. And I, I, I don't feel strongly about it. And then in the 500, 1k, 2k games on GG that I played, I played 2,700 hands of 500, 1k or bigger this year on that site. And I never felt like there was, um, cheating. I guess there were guys that got banned for, uh, live assisting. Yeah, I, I guess there, a few there was of those a guys bunch got, of players, 40 players got banned for using eight RTIs. Yeah, and, A few of those guys were playing that game, but I saw a lot of mistakes, or at least I thought were mistakes. And um, I know two or three of the players that were banned that played against me. Um, I don't know. It, it didn't feel to me that they were, if they were cheating, they weren't very good at it. I mean, it's it just having shards open. I don't think it's, it's then so obvious. I can imagine that they might not be aware of, you know, you just have a solve open or you have just have some preflop ranges open and yeah. then you just take a glimpse. It's not like this hardcore cheating where you have post-flop um, situations solved by a real-time solver and then you just, and it also takes yeah, a lot I of time to figure that out. Like That's what I was going to say. I, I, I think <clears> with 
without like external software, like, and I'm sure that people have thought of great ways to cheat. I mean, if there's big money laying around, people are going to cheat. That's yeah, just the way sure. that it works. Yeah. Right. But like most of these guys, I don't know, most of the guys that have been winning at poker for 10 years, I would like to hope that they, they weren't, they weren't cheating. I don't yeah. know. I'm just always surprised how greedy and how like it's some, honestly, it takes a little bit of brain to do successful cheating, right? Like breaking into your hotel room. You need to think things through. You, you, you have a bit of a, a certain level oh, of intelligence, crazy. right? But then yeah. when it comes to the cheating, being so fucking obvious, you, you, yeah. you could cheat if you have a little bit of brain, nobody would notice. Dude, yeah. if we both would play against each other and I would be cheating, you would not figure it out. And I'm pretty sure. No way. No way. Because here and there, you yeah. know, you make a call where you win. You know, you, you're going to, I would run over you, but uh, still like, you know, it's just, oh, you know, I just made good laydowns or, and you don't need to be a, a, a huge poker brain. And that's just also this Mike Postel game. Like, what do you think, dude? Like, <laughs> Folding King's prefab and all that shit he did. Like, yeah. what is yeah, wrong so with sad. you? And then you Deep could word. call four bets That's with, right. I don't know, what was it, like nine six off. Like, yeah. <sighs> this is where. They just I, can't help themselves, man. It's yeah. the ego. They just want to boss everyone up, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I guess. I mean, it's lucky, lucky uh, that they're that dumb. Uh, and it's scary <laughs> yeah. if there's someone who's very smart and cheating. That's actually the scary yeah. part, right? That make there it in a very is subtle way. Yeah. Here and there, you know? Man, yeah. Thank you so much. I hope yeah, you man. are going to. What is? What are we going to do in the in the next? What are you in the upcoming projects? Uh, is there anything you do uh, apart from playing poker, business wise? Are you involved in something that you want to share? I um, you know, th there are uh, a lot of things I'm interested in. Um, a few, few poker things that I, I can't share yet, but for the most part. Um, I'm on to, uh, I'm, on to I'm, not, I'm still playing poker full time, Okay. but most of my projects now are just trying to be around my wife, trying to learn the guitar, trying to, yeah, I can know, see it in the background. I was about to ask yeah, who's man, playing the guitar been doing this for, you know, I've been playing poker for 15 years. So it's like, uh, I told myself once I, I achieved financial independence and, and really, put the grind in and pushed myself that I would taper off and do things that I, I I'm not very good at and mm -hmm. try to be more well-rounded because as you know, you don't really get to be well-rounded and really good at poker. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So past I've been using kind of the pandemic since there hasn't been big live poker to play as that, that time to try to get a little healthier, to try to get a little, yeah, more in shape, better at a few random things, hang out with some friends. And it's been really great. Yeah. I'm happy to hear that. Seems you're, Thanks, you're you're enjoying life despite you have been recently infected with the virus, but you're looking good. Yeah, I feel great. Finally, towards the end of it. Great. So uh, big thanks for not for only for me, but also from our entire community. Um, there's so much more that I guess uh, not only the community but also myself would like to know. But maybe you we're gonna see each other again here uh, talk about more stuff around poker mindset, your journey. It was really a pleasure talking to me, to you, Jason. And I really hope I'm not going to see you at any tables in the near future. <laughs> If not, you know what's going to happen. Bad beat, yeah, bad I'm beat, bad beat. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, I was really, really feeling bad and serious. Like, I think it was even sessions yeah. where I couldn't win a single hand. Like, it was insane. But when it went against you, I was like, I was your guardian uh, angel. I yeah, was like, yeah, buddy. you were saving my sessions. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you again. And if you guys have any questions, drop it in the comments or anything that you would like to know. Um, just, you know, let us know and then see you guys next time. Bye bye.